Hello and welcome to The Good, The Scars and the Rugby in partnership with our friends at Allianz. We've got the team in the studio. Everyone has made it through Christmas and the new year. Uh, Happy New Year, by the way. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, Emily, uh, what was Christmas like on the farm? It was billed to be nice and big and it turned out to just me, me, mum and dad because my brother and his wife got COVID, my cousin got COVID, um, so we were a, a bit more separate than we'd hoped to be but it was still really nice in a weird way. Obviously, I don't spend a huge t- amount of time with mum and dad anymore um, so it was kind of nice not to have like all the fanfare, do you know what I mean? It was just us three chilling at home so that was kind of actually really nice. Or oh, did it involve just lying on the couch and mum and da- mum doing everything? Our mum does an amazing Christmas dinner. Oh, yeah, and yeah. it was like, all for you, basically. <laughs> basically, yeah. yeah. Although we did still sh- we shipped out plates to my brother and his wife, so we took oh, yeah, we delivered those. In the house up the hill, they're not far away. Yeah, so we delivered. So they did really well because oh. they didn't even have to cook or anything. They were just sat up there <laughs> having so a that, uh, little bit of a cough hello, every now and again. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Literally, delivery to your door. There we go. Christmas dinner. Boom, boom. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. And you? Yeah, very good, actually. Uh, plans got uh, got interrupted. Uh, but my mum and dad came, and my brother and his wife and their kids came down and did four days down with us. Um, so that was great. I hadn't seen my mum and dad much or my brother. Uh, so it was great to just spend some time with them with the girls spending some time with their cousins and uh and then yeah and then we we ducked and dived around to see as many people from from Zara's side as we could um through the next four days as well she's a Tyndall family Zara's reunion side. and then the Zara's Royal. side as Zara's well side. yeah also known as the Royals yeah <laughs> yeah so no it, it was great I mean we yeah was, we got uh we did Christmas day up there and then and then jumped to a, around to see a few of her cousins as well so it was great nice very nice. And did you, you, Elma? Obviously, I, we had, you had a very special cr- early Christmas present arrive. Yes, my husband did make it over for Christmas, which was the Christmas miracle of 2021. It did actually happen. Um, we had Christmas lunch in a local pub. Because oh, cute. So the way forward now, isn't it? Never no, done that. I never have to clean up. Oh, I was Yeah, so the way. So with my mum and dad, because we did it early, so we did it on the 22nd, we basically got... So, we. Yeah, we got someone in to cook. Uh, uh, and it was brilliant. That is no, cheating. Can we no just go clean, back to that? Sorry. No cleaning up. No, no you didn't nothing. Go out, you it got was the best in. money ever spent. <laughs> um, yeah, so because there was because uh, there was Zara's brother as well and and the girls and 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 Zara's dad. Uh, so we then, you know, we just got someone in to come and do it all. And they clean up and they do everything. Because we've got like a little on the farm, we've got like a little barn we can do it in, so we can have it completely separate from your house, so you get no debris. Oh, oh wow. it's amazing! So good, so good. Jeez, you have life <laughs> sorted. I thought going to the pub was genius, <laughs> but that is next level. You brought the pub home. Yeah, yeah. And as a South African, I didn't realize this. Christmas is a pub at the pub is very fancy. I don't know if it was just this pub, but the food it wasn't just. And your average Trimmings. pub fare, it was brilliant. So um, I, we, I did feel like I wanted to support the local, um, you know, hospitality industry because when I spoke to them, they did also say that, look, they had loads of cancellations. So it's fine if you need to cancel, you know, well, like we understand it's this time of the year, everyone started getting COVID. And then we managed to go and we actually had a lot of large section of the place to ourselves. So good. Amazing. But brilliant. Um, we did spend New Year isolating, though, because if you didn't have it over Christmas, you had it over New Year. <laughs> you couldn't have both, could you? No, no, no. <laughs> well, oh, dear. M- most people were in for New Year's this year, weren't they, anyway? Not a lot. I don't think much. People weren't going too wild. Well, not from my, what I've heard, anyway. <laughs> Tits is looking like Tits is <laughs> giving me a bit of side eye, like, what? <laughs> what? Yeah, no, very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we were all pretty much back to work over the last week. You guys have been like just knocking out the big guests on the good, the bad, and the rugby. Just like yeah. well, I was supposed to be in Australia now. Oh, really? Already? Yeah. Oh. I was, we should have gone five days ago, but um, yeah, just we didn't fancy uh, Novak's journey, so we, uh, <laughs> we decided to say oh. Actually, no, because we're vaccinated. But there you go. Um, <laughs> It, yeah, it was just I, uh, you know, the, the, each state in Australia has different regulations, and it would have still involved a two-week 
would have had to quarantine for two weeks over there. What's so crazy, um, uh, over the fence in, in a different sport, in cricket, and in South Africa, the cricket had to be played in empty stadiums. But it was 38 degrees in Cape Town on Saturday. And the entire Western Cape, like 4 million people were on the beaches. So the, the beaches were literally, it was just people everywhere. It was like ants. Literally like it's ants, like but no one could go to the cricket. <laughs> but that, but the, that goes back to the original lockdown when we went through the, the very first one. It was baking hot in England for the first time. And literally every beach in Cornwall was just <laughs> rammed with people. And you're going, but you can't, the pubs are shut because you can't yeah. go in for a drink. Yeah. It's just, it just doesn't make sense. Madness. Either. Yeah. And then you got a last minute call up on the first weekend, kind of back into action. Yeah. You were in? So I went up to Manchester. So our game v Wasps was called off. Mm -hmm. So that freed me up on the... Not that I was playing, obviously. But <laughs> <laughs> You've kept that under the rest. <laughs> I was going to say. Cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but obviously I've been helping out and trying to get involved when I can at Loughborough. So, um, so yeah, I went up to the sale Exeter game mm -hmm. um, and did some of the Prem 15s coverage which was cool. I arrived and it was hammering it down and the entire journey up. So I wasn't too hopeful, but actually stayed dry for the entire game. So that was something. So it happens um, when you're Emily Scarry, you walk and, out of the car and this is... So we were in the commentary position. <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> and then, um, so we were on the stand where nobody else is. The fans are on the, the opposite side. Jason Robinson walks around. Hi guys, just chatting, you know, catching up, whatever. And then he was like, the actual reason I've come around is I just wondered if you want a tea or coffee. And then at half time, bless him, he came back with... Three, three teas, three waters, three pies, pulled some sugar out of his pocket. Just what a good bloke. What Such a, a good bloke. I know. So good. Jason Robinson, if you're watching this, <laughs> if you want to hang around Fulham on a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we, we'd love to, you know, have a coffee I'm as well. actually quite desperate, parched right now. Jason <laughs> <laughs> oh, It's so good. Such wow. a nice place. Yeah, he's a and Brilliant. You were off doing bits, weren't you? BBC gig? Yes, I was in Edinburgh and the sun shone on uh, the same day that I was in Edinburgh. I know. I took the, the good weather with me. No sunglasses, though, so I was sitting there squinting. But um, also, sadly, no fans. So I was the only person to enjoy the vitamin D that came streaming onto my skin. Yeah. It's sad, isn't it, that we're back to that, that Wales and no fans in Wales and uh, Scotland. Hopefully it get sorted for the Six Nations. I Come know there's on. There's plans afoot. Yes. Hopefully, the more we talk about it, the more pressure it puts on. So allow yes. fans in those stands. Put it on the agenda, please. I mean, Edinburgh um, now leads the United Rugby Championship log for the first time since 2009, and their fans couldn't be there on Saturday to see them clinch the top spot. So, uh, it's rubbish, isn't it? Yeah. Such a pity. Um, but we, we do have rugby being played, and we get to go and watch this rugby and call it work, <laughs> which is always really nice. Love um, the way you did that. <laughs> yeah, I do sometimes still like kind of look over my shoulder and go, has no one figured out that this isn't work yet? <laughs> but I'm really appreciative. The, the, the headline of the weekend, however, unfortunately out of the Prem 15s, or is it unfortunate, is that massive scoreline at the expense of uh, DMP. Uh, Emily Scarrett, where do you stand on this? <sighs> look, it's, it's really hard, isn't it? Um, I don't know if you saw Nick Heath's tweet because I think he was covering the game yesterday um, and I thought I, I often agree with Nick Keith to be fair so um, I thought he was pretty spot on I think it's you know they need support in the north of England and that's not trying to pity them or it's not trying to suggest that they're not working hard and they're not trying hard because all of the above are definitely true but for some reason the, the rugby and that kind of the north of England is is and has been struggling for a little while. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, we see it in the men's game. There's, there's such a brilliant population of people and rugby players and sports people up there that, you know, we just, we want it to be competitive. And I suppose from a league point of view, you always want every single game to be super competitive mm. or at least, you know, not. A, a massive walkover like obviously 104 nil quite yeah. clearly is you can't dress that up in any <laughs> yeah. other way unfortunately how, um, how does the budget works on on it on the individual teams in the Premier 15s so there's a so is it is it like owner based and then yeah. the owners put money in yeah so there's a I think there's a salary cap there's not a salary cap in force this year no. um, but there'll be one next year but at the same time that doesn't mean that all the clubs will have 
the ability to reach that even yeah, if they yeah. wanted to. Well, that's the same as the men's game. You know, yeah. it, obviously it shifted from seven point five down to five or whatever it is now uh, for the next two years, but not every club hits that five. Yeah, yeah. Poppy Cleal tweeted, um, "It's not great. The league isn't perfect, but I tell you what, the team is every reason I started playing rugby. Thanks for the game." Go on. Oh, I just. Maybe this is because I was supporting the South African women's team when they were up in the north recently. And you know, even before they took off and, and caved down, that they're not going to come here and win. That, that's not the point of the exercise. They were coming here to, to gain experience. But it's different when you're a national team. When you're a club side and you have to put in all of that work. And as, as you know, like you've heard all of these stories of players who have day jobs and then play rugby. It does make you wonder how sustainable that is. And that's what worries me, is how, how you keep attracting talent to a team when this is the kind of scoreline. Yeah. But with it being so relatively isolated up there, the, the, you know, if, if girls want to play rugby, there's not... You, so you've got a massive drive down to probably Sale is the, the closest. So, you know, you're, you're basically trying to dive in on the on the local talent but then obviously if they're not if they are getting beat that heavily are you going to recruit the talent it's a it's a double edged sword you, you're hoping that they're watching England games and going I still want to get into it whatever um, and they don't lose motivation but that's going to be the hardest thing isn't it keeping think that motivation your point there is exactly why I don't think anybody is questioning their commitment to what they're doing because if anything their commitment is probably greater than yeah. most people's in the league just because of where they live and yeah. every away game is flipping miles away for them and it's a huge time commitment every you know it's a full Saturday gone if not more than that so you know there's no, there's never a question over that it's just yeah you've got to and might you might have more experience of this than me but you've got to somehow change something like that because yeah. it's not going to happen in small steps I don't I don't think no. um, you need probably some cash you need to attract some you know proper players internationals from wherever and then you, and then all of a sudden, it starts to become a bit more attractive to others. Yeah. And uh, I don't it, know. I, I'm not sure. I mean, um, it is really difficult. I mean, you look at you know Newcastle have gone through little circles of life, but you know ultimately when they were in their pomp and when we turned pro in '97, you know um, Hall or whatever it was put so much money in. And you had Dean Ryan up there. You had Rob Andrew Wilco was up there. You had uh, to uh, to uh, to Marla, You had all these names. And that won you a yeah won you a title, but ultimately it's still quite damp and wet up in Newcastle. Same with Durham, <laughs> uh, and you know how many fans are going to come and watch you in what is just a football hotbed? Uh, it's it's got everything against it, to, mm. and it's how do you crack that? And it's it's not easy, but you need clubs like that. You need the diversity of of allowing people to be able to play rugby wherever they are. Mm. Um, it's just how you then can then package it and sell it. Um, because as you say long journeys probably going to get every game knowing that you're not going to win it, it yeah it's it, it's a difficult one but as I say I, you've got to give massive kudos to the girls who keep turning out and still playing and still wanting to play and wanting to get better and um, yeah it needs some help but um, I, d I don't know where the best place to start yes it's easy to save more cash but that's we're just, short term, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. you've, you've got to find something sustainable. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. you. You've got to have something in the north. You can't yeah. just. It's not as easy as people saying, or you know, perhaps they shouldn't be in the league or whatever. But then you're you're it isolated. Solve no, it, it takes, doesn't solve anything. It takes another club out there. It takes more players not not playing at that standard or getting that exposure. So you're never going to get any uh, uplift in terms of performances and upskilling of players. You still. You still learn every time, even even if it's a painful lesson. You are still learning every time you play. Mm, mm. Um, but what is the is the best answer? I'm not entirely sure. The interesting thing for me is is uh, Durham as a university. Um, I think yeah, what is either Newcastle or Northumbria as a university. They have a really strong women's program. Same for like Edinburgh and Glasgow in terms of the book stuff, which is like the the top tier of uh, university rugby. They have they're in the the Premier League if you like um, so there's something obviously that isn't quite then transcending through in terms of or up I suppose into yeah. so the, the Prem rugby do they lose their talent to bigger Southern clubs Yeah I don't know I don't know what it is the the problem they've got is how you 
turn the tide now because yeah. the league is getting stronger, it's getting better. Every club is improving in terms of their infrastructure, in terms of their resources, in terms of what they're putting out on the field. So, you know, back in the day when I played for Litchfield, we went through a couple of rough seasons where you weren't winning a huge amount, but the league was of such whereby, you know, nothing much changed. Mm. Do you know what mm. I mean? Mm. Nothing much changed. So it was just a case of sticking together, working on X, Y and Z, and then you got a couple of good runs at the same time. Whereas now the league is just steamrolling ahead mm. and how do you stay with that when you're probably not with it at the moment yeah it's a bit like Ruby Tui's tweets where she said um, if uh, women's rugby was an NFT she would buy it right now because uh, that ish is going to grow well let's see what DMP uh, does they play Bristol next and on the topic of Bristol shall we welcome our guest let's yeah. do it jinx one of the fastest players to have ever played sevens rugby. She's pure gas, double Olympian, Wales international, and year one and two teacher. Uh, Jazz Joyce, welcome to the good, the scars, and the rugby. Why did you do a little giggle there when I said your name? Are you surprised? <laughs> do you think <laughs> no, I was always... just, the, just the year one and two teacher? I mean, I don't know if I can call myself that yet, but. We'll see. <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're not here to talk any rugby. I'm just here for life lessons on how to manage Mia. So, uh, Jazz, <laughs> right? When they don't listen to you constantly, <laughs> how do you deal with that? Just be on their wave, be childish, play games. <laughs> I should, I should be able to do that. That's basically my life. <laughs> I was, I was, are you are, are you doing anything else at the moment? I mean, are you speaking? <laughs> no, that's what I should be doing. I'm just going to play games. Okay, well. but they don't like it when the parents do it. When other people do it, they get all on board with it. When when uh, when you do it as a parent, they tend not to listen to you. It's because you're not cool. Because then. you, yeah, yeah. Well, you probably try and win. All right, every time. all right. Yeah. Don't, don't jump in there. Jump in there a bit over quicker try. about me not being cool. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but how, seriously, how far off being a year one and two teacher are you then? Three weeks. <laughs> okay, well that doesn't count. I mean, yeah. it's under Same a month, thing. and you'll be a year one and two teacher. Yeah. Excited. Yeah, I am. To be fair, like after obviously being full time for the last year, going back to placement now. It's like, yeah, basically just in, reassures me that I do want to be a teacher when like rugby kind of doesn't go anywhere anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been a bit of a shock to the system though, no? Like being a full-time rugby player. We all know what it, that's like. It's quite nice. It's quite a nice lifestyle. And then It really was. Like my alarm this morning was at 6.30. So I went to the gym in the morning and then went to school, well, 8.20 till, let's say, 4 o'clock. And then come home, cook dinner, and then here I am. You are. Well, yeah, you we're, are. we're well, really. Thank you for being here. Yeah. <laughs> no, my pleasure. After after a long day wrangling year ones and twos, from from what I hear, they do require a bit of wrangling. Uh, so, what is it about teaching that you then enjoy or get satisfaction from that day? Um, I think it's just enjoyment from. As, like being childish with them as silly as it sounds like I just enjoy having fun playing around with them um doing well uh, trying to do loads of stuff outdoors um sometimes that can't happen but yeah even doing like math science outdoors getting them outdoors I just love yeah just love teaching them I guess and coaching and stuff like that it's really interesting if you had to like if you had to teach would you go for the little ease or would you go all the way to the other end of the spectrum um, that's a very good question. <laughs> I, a very good question. if I was, co if I was, if I, if I was got, talking about coaching rugby, I would always go to the older age of mm. the spectrum, fifteen plus. But I think there is still a lot of fun to be had, um, coaching or teaching eight year olds, nine year olds. -year -olds. I did some primary PE once when I was just out of university, and that was little ones, probably like jazz, and they just. It's fun. As long as you appreciate that they're not going to listen to you, they're probably not going to learn anything, they're not actually going to do what you say. But if you can just facilitate the madness, it's actually a lot of fun. <laughs> and maybe that's what it is. It's not teaching, it's just facilitating. How many different ways okay. can you hop yeah. in different positions? Beanbags, we're a winner. But you've got a load of beanbags at school. Yeah, they love it. Balls, spots, everything. And, and is it at that age where if you have one or two kids in the class under control, it's almost like the rest follow suit? Or does that not apply? Yeah, no, I don't know. Does the characters count at that time? There's still people be followers of 
the cool kids. I don't, I don't know. know, Jazz will know better than me, but I just found that if there was one that did what you said, they were the teacher's pet, in inverted commas, <laughs> oh. and everyone else was like more the norm. Yeah. yeah. I feel, yeah, I I feel Skaz is one... describing herself. <laughs> no. <laughs> if, you've, if you've got one that doesn't listen or two, then the class just gets disrupted because then everyone then will follow them. But that's what I've found. It's, I, I taught year four before Christmas and that's what I found in year four, but I've obviously only just come to year one and two now. So I'm hoping that's not the case. What would you want to go into once you've qualified properly? Younger ones, even like as young as nursery and reception. Just yeah, life in the sandpit. Yeah. yeah I, can, I can loan you Lena for a good week if you want. Fine. <laughs> I'm in. Premium, it'll, come at, it'll come at a charge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so you, you do the Diddy rugby, the Little E's rugby head coaching as well as the coaching, well, getting them through school uh, during the week. You literally cannot get enough. <laughs> no. So I don't actually coach during Diddy rugby. So I ah. just kind of like manage it. So I've got coaches that, that coach the children during that. But I do, when I have more time, want to go down and, and actually coach and, and do stuff there because that's more, it's 45 minutes of fun rather than like five, six hours of teaching. So I do want to do more stuff in that. Uh, but at the moment, I've got coaches doing that. How's it going? Because that's pretty new for you, isn't it? The Diddy Rugby stuff. Yeah, really new. Like, um, when did we take over? We took over just before Christmas. Um, so yeah, December. Um, yeah, really good. Um, so the person I took over from, Robin, she just didn't have time um kind of to not to run it properly but to give as much effort she would have liked to have to kind of build the build the business so um at the moment just basically playing rugby um me and alicia my partner so both have a lot more time to to give to to building the business and getting a lot more people um a lot more children well active and, and getting a rugby ball in their hands as early as possible are you seeing a change in terms of the little girls that now come play have you seen the impact at that age group that the profile that women's rugby is already enjoying having some moving the needle? Yeah, definitely. Maybe not at that age because the, well, Diddy Rugby is 18 months to six. Maybe not that age, but definitely say seven, well, even six plus. Um, you definitely see, yeah, change of impact and kind of the profile we bring. Um, social media is massive. Telly is massive at the moment for us. So as soon as little girls see that, and kind of remember who people are they're like oh my god she's on telly um but yeah the, the change is massive because when I was younger playing rugby growing up you didn't have anyone not that we didn't have role models but we didn't have anyone to to watch on telly like I guess Twitter and Instagram do so much for rugby players at the moment because you get to actually know them as a person rather than just a player as well and the like um all the podcasts like everything like that 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 gives us the publicity is yeah is growing the game massively diddy rugby's class as well have you taken yours to anything like that because i've been involved because it's vicky mcqueen isn't it who runs the yeah. whole gig i've been to a couple up in leicestershire um of because they're all over the place depending on yeah. where they're being run and they're just the kids just love it it's such good fun they there's yeah. a couple of videos where the little girl's like oh i just really wanted to run around with a rugby ball or boys it doesn't matter it was yeah. anybody i think the parents probably End up having more fun sometimes than the kids, bless them. But. Yeah, we had we got rugby tots down by us, but we haven't oh. got a diddies. Um, but yeah, Mia, Mia just ended up going to Minchinham. You've just Minchin. sworn at Jazz by saying it. Sorry, sorry, Jazz. <laughs> is is there is there one no. near near my area? Um, uh, Minchinhampton actually had an introduction to girls on the weekend, and some of the Gloucester, Gloucester Hartbury girls Very went nice. down. Oh, yeah. brilliant! There you go. It's, I think it's. It's getting out there more and more, hopefully. Definitely. Yeah, and you, you kind of, uh, hopefully, if you're not reaching the kids, then hopefully you're reaching the parents that encourage them to kind of get out there and participate and kind of take up the opportunity. You, you started playing at seven. I googled yeah. the place that you are from. It looks, <laughs> it looks, it's basically in the sea, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> literally I live at the end of Wales, basically on the sea, yeah, St. David. So it's, yeah, furthest west as you can go, pretty much. And it smallest is a city in Britain. Just the, like, no. the smallest city. I, I was looking, I couldn't figure out whether it was a national park or if there are actually... <laughs> People I've, live there. It was very green on Google Maps. Yeah. <laughs> Had a great night out in there, actually, St. David's. I think, um, Brilliant. Uh, Nigel, Nigel Davis, who used to coach Gloucester, he's, that's his haunt. And we had our oh, 
Yeah. We had our coaches meeting in St. David's, yeah. It's all right. Brilliant. Pubs don't <laughs> kick you out. It's all good for me. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> unless COVID plays a part. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> this was very much pre-COVID. I was yeah. playing, so it was in black and white at the time. <laughs> So being from St. David's, did that require a lot of driving basically everywhere? You just kind of always factored in an extra, what, two, three hours into wherever something happened? That's just a yeah. civilization. And then you've <laughs> <Yeah>. got to... <laughs> yeah. Just any shop, really. <laughs> um, no, definitely. Like when I started playing kind of like further away than, than St. David's or so Halford West and, and stuff like that, my parents had to drive me. So yeah, like, the, the closest club then was 45 minutes away from me. So my parents to, to drive me to that, wait around and then come back. It, it was massive for them to do that. They had to take time off work and, and, and things like that. So for them to do it is brilliant. And I definitely wouldn't be playing rugby for Wales and all sorts of teams if they wouldn't have taken me places. And 45 minutes was the closest trip they took. So they did take trips up to when I played for Wales was... It took, what, two and a half hours to get to Cardiff. So, yeah, two and a half hours, three times a week is mental. Wow. Because yeah. you've you've now, you made so many headlines because you've gone back to essentially amateur rugby from being literally one of the people who lit up the Seven series, which is, I mean, it's such a tragic reality check about sometimes how we move forward and then we take steps back again in this industry. But you have been kind of going the extra mile in a very literal sense. From when you started <laughs> playing rugby. So are you just taking all of this in your stride? Yeah, definitely. We only um, dream of being a professional rugby player when you're younger. You, especially when we were younger, we didn't kind of have the aspiration of being a full-time athlete, full-time rugby player. So for it to be finally put in place um, for us is fantastic. And I think prior to, I know, so post Rio, mm. that's when I struggled the most was kind of going to Rio, spending a full year being full time. And then I actually had to go back to university then. So that was kind of a, the hardest hit in. Whereas now coming off the back of full time Tokyo and stuff like that, it's not too tough because I can go back into kind of being full time and stuff like that. But um, it's tough, I guess, to probably not be playing back on the world stage on the sevens. Um, but hopefully I'll get that through the World Cup. It's mad, isn't it, that? I mean, I'm sure I definitely know Jazz's opinion on it, but for the girls to be part of GB in Rio, then kick back out into their unions, then come... I know COVID played a huge part in it, didn't it, this time around, but come back as GB, do really well again. Obviously, it's heartbreak, but it did really well. And then get kicked back out into their unions again. Players like Jazz, the Scottish girls, so many players now that are able to step up on that stage. And Because I think realistically, probably prior to Rio, you probably didn't have the the wealth of players across the other nations to potentially play on the world stage. Mm. That was the reality of it. But certainly now it's completely different, but now they don't get that opportunity. And it's, again, it's probably not a question for Jazz because I think I know her opinion <laughs> on it. And obviously she's the, she's the one caught in the middle of a lot of it, but it's, it's really tough. I think the hardest part for us, like speaking from different nations, so Scottish and Welsh, is that the fact we don't get the opportunity to do it. So like, obviously I lived the dream last year of playing the World Series got to play in Olympic Games and then I guess you come back to to Wales and like I love playing for Wales love playing in the Six Nations autumns but for sevens I love sevens just as much as 15 so with sevens we don't really get much exposure from that so I I guess I get a tournament a year so a tournament every four years where I get to play on the world stage as a sevens player because obviously with Wales we are in like rugby Europe relegation so we play teams who aren't the best in the world. So it is really tough that we don't then get the opportunity to play week in, week out. Like, well, obviously the English girls now are, are going to Spain in end of January and I'm in Wales, so. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Would but, you look yeah. at the American League? Would you fancy a bit of that? Because that looks like it's potentially going to be pretty cool, isn't it? Obviously, I know you've done bits before overseas. Yeah, like my friend went to the Australian one whenever prior COVID was and she said it was brilliant and she loved everything there like the coaching the players um and the setup there so definitely would look to go over there but it's just so tough because when's the right time to go over um especially with Wales and Korea do you, can you get funding for it can you get paid when you're out there so there's no much so much aspects because I potentially look to go to Japan as well um but it's just knowing when the right time is um to go really 
That's interesting. Did you enjoy Japan that much? Is it just the opportunity to play? <laughs> Um, yeah, different country as well. Um, I went to Australia and, and did that for four months, which was brilliant. But I think Japan is a different, it's a different country in it, different yeah. culture, um, yeah. different atmosphere. So I think to go there and travel it and, and play sevens, I think, yeah, it would be, would be brilliant. It's where the cash is at the moment, isn't it as well? That is, I didn't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, Chase it. definitely Chase one it. element of it. <laughs> <laughs> So but it, but the only it reason is, Hask went was for the cash. Yeah. It, but yeah. it is also, I mean, if you're going to go live somewhere else, that is, I mean, that is an extreme shift in terms of lifestyle and culture and everything is just, it's so different. A bit different to St. David's. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a bit different to St. David's. But I think we we travel the world playing rugby, but we, well, we don't travel the world, if you get me. Like, we're away for to two weeks, but we actually only get, say, four days off to mm. go and explore so you're not actually traveling the country you're just there playing rugby effectively so japan is definitely a place i would like to go and explore as a like a traveler as well as then play rugby out there it's great it's one of the best countries that 2019 world cup oh, and we were fortunate to go it. up and down it and yeah it's, it's got everything <laughs> that you want you don't need to go to bed in tokyo and <laughs> there's really nice places in kyoto and then there's can almost if you've got tattoos, you can get in fighting places in. Uh, where were we when, when Hask was? These guys kept Hask's obviously got quite a few tattoos, and every time we go near a door, the bouncer just go, "Mate, you don't want to come in here." Mm-hmm. Really? And he's like, "Okay," and because Hask had been there, he knew that meant that you don't want to go in there yeah. <laughs> because they class tattoos as as you're part of a uh, like oh, not yeah, a clan a or or a, a gang, you're part, yeah, you're part of a gang or whatever. So he was just like, "Don't come in here." And Hask was like, "Okay." He said, that's what you got to get used to. Don't get argumentative about it. Just go Mm-mm. find go find somewhere else. It's been tough for him. Yeah. Did, you, did you guys get up to anything when, when you were there for the Olympics? Or were you just so COVID kind of caged in your little athlete's village? Pretty much. Like, um, yeah, we were. We had a holding camp in um, Yokohama, maybe. I, I don't know, somewhere in Japan. I think it was called that. Um, so we got to explore a tiny bit then, but not like massive amounts. And then as soon as we were in the village, then we were in the village for the, the rest of the games. But even being in the village, you still got to experience like um, the culture of Japan. Like we had heated toilet seats. Oh, which was <laughs> best. Insane. I love that that's part of their culture. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. The best But like the toilet seats were insane. And then you got like buses as well. They weren't being driven. They were just, you had like buttons and they just go. So it was cool that we got to see stuff um, like that part of their culture. But no, we didn't get to go out and explore. Did you guys as the athletes just have like big old parties once your competitive uh, stretch wrapped up? Did you kind of? Um, pretty much, yeah. So um, <laughs> there's like an official and an unofficial answer to this, isn't there, Jess? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we definitely had a party after. I, well, a lot of us have worked five years for that effectively. So um, it was, yeah, like obviously we didn't do as well as we hoped, but mm. I think putting five years into something is almost a relief when it's over. <laughs> You're like, okay, I can now like have a drink. I can eat a chocolate bar. I'm extreme within that anyway, but I could relax. <laughs> I think I've actually just stopped relaxing now. After Christmas, I'm like, okay, I'll get back to rugby now. <laughs> Are you like anyone I know that's fast? You just love, you actually get faster on chocolate and crisps. <laughs> no. James Simpson Daniel, who I used to room with, he had a Monster Munch sandwich before he'd go to bed hmm. and then a bar of dairy oh, milk. And I'm like, if I eat that, I'm just going to get fat. Mm. And he gets leaner. <laughs> like really annoying. He a bit like that. He strike me as the, that could be your... You just run faster um, on sugar. No, I'm quite good at disciplining myself as in eating, so um, I can't comment on that, no. <laughs> <laughs> can't reveal either way whether I do or no. whether I do. <laughs> yeah. So what is the naughty thing that you've kind of afforded yourself for the last six months then that you didn't do for the five years prior in terms um, of food? Uh, alcohol, well, alcohol was definitely one. I, I literally don't think I... I must have drank once in the last five years, like not even exaggeration, yeah. Um, so... <laughs> Due to COVID. Sorry, Elma can't process that at all. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, COVID obviously played a massive part in that. So um, for the two years of COVID, like I just didn't, there was, there was nothing to do. And I, I don't enjoy personally having just like a drink at the house. So I, I wouldn't do that anyway. Um, but post-Olympics, 
um, I have genuinely been drunk the entire time. <laughs> 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 not, even, not even joking. Like I literally, I went to Prague like post Christmas, and I, we were literally drunk for the whole four days. And I've, I, I've not, I've never done that, but like, yeah, it was brilliant, and I proper relaxed. <laughs> I've never done it either. Yeah. So. <laughs> Tins can't relate at all. <laughs> I have I've been in Prague over New Year's and I have to say it is the single drunkest night that like we had well, the, the friends that were there. I have never seen my husband that drunk in like almost two decades. It is the the kind of place where you can have that. Did you just go straight just into drunk. embrace the culture straight vodkas? Like was it all quite hard from the start or yeah. did you build yeah. yeah so that's the problem <laughs> isn't it go to a country that can drink vodka for fun and you go I can do that <laughs> yeah. no I can't next day no I can't an hour ne- later ne- yeah. next thing you're speaking languages you didn't know that you could speak <laughs> <laughs> you're like there are only consonants here I don't wait those yeah I have no idea what I'm saying <laughs> I'm glad to hear that you did cut loose and have some fun though yeah I really did <laughs> <laughs> does it I'm still go sober now does, uh, <laughs> hi I'm Jazz I'm four days sober <laughs> teacher Jazz has sobered up just in time for a placement <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's good would be interesting going into the kids hi kids <laughs> yeah not a good first day that is it so you yeah. came back from wait you came back from Japan um and then you basically wrapped up the seventh season in Dubai. What was yeah. Dubai like? Yeah, I've been to Dubai to play for Wales before, but it's just a different level playing in Dubai on the World Series. The crowds, we didn't have crowds for the first um, kind of tournament, but for the second one, we had crowds and it was it was insane. Um, the, the crowds in Dubai are mental and the place had well been in lockdown for however long. Sevens hadn't been... <laughs> Um, a thing for for two years so the the crowds there were yeah if you and if you've been you kind of would know what it's like um but again another thing on top of the crowds and kind of sevens being back was it was well the first time I really got to play on the circuit so again that was again another great experience for me and yeah I'd love to do that kind of day in day out play on the circuit travel the world but um we're at Wales just aren't there yet I literally feel like this is a bit like Alicia's like crowdfunding thing. Like, surely there is something we can do. Surely there is a, a like uh, something we can sign, something we can do online. Barbarians team on the circuit. Yes. Yeah. The best uh, players of players who aren't on the circuit. And you've spent some time thinking uh, yeah. about this already. <laughs> I can tell. Because <laughs> there's so many team. girls out there. Yeah, from yeah. different like, nations, like South Africa. So like not just kind of UK, but so many girls out there who girls come on um so teams come on the circuit as a invitational team and you watch girls individuals light up the circuit there but it's same with them they're never going to get the opportunity to play on that circuit because their like country just isn't good enough or doesn't have the funding which sometimes happens okay dragon's den pitch give us yeah. your call yeah. up your team the jazz joyous barbarians yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're in we're in <laughs> That would be classy fair. There's a, I can't remember the girl's name, but there was an absolute flyer from Papua New Guinea who yeah. tore up every time Again. they got on the invitational scene, but yeah. obviously struggled in the team and that, that they had and didn't, they appeared like once a season or something daft. But I, I, I really do think, I've been thinking about this, but I really do think they need to do <laughs> something different with, like, and I think you need to separate the men and the women because they, they are totally different. Obviously the men, Scotland, um, Wales and Ireland all compete on the World Series, whereas obviously the Welsh and the Scottish women don't. So why why can't the women BGB? Because it's not going to yes. affect the teams. Guys, Sorry, Jazz, I have no out. I have no say sort in this. This, this is just my opinion. Scares <laughs> for president. Yes. Scares for president. <laughs> but you it's definitely t- have contacts. You can sort this out, guys. <laughs> definitely but, have people. <laughs> but but it's different, isn't it? I understand if you you make the men GB. It obviously has you know, a knock-on effect to the amount of teams in the yeah. series, blah, 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 blah. But for the women, it literally, it, it's nothing. Well, why don't you just... And that that's very commonsensical and I appreciate... that word, commonsensical? Yeah. Sounds good. Um, I appreciate there's, you know, much more behind it than that. But 
you, you've got to, you've got to, I think you've got to treat them differently. And at the moment, they're just grouped as sevens. Agreed. Speaking of great ideas, um, Wales uh, gave contracts to women's rugby players and there was a lot of fanfare and celebration when the news came out. Um, yeah, I was fortunate enough to be one of the um, 12 contracts that have come out. Yay! Yeah, Zero so surprise. Living, yeah, <laughs> living the dream of a professional rugby player again. Um, so when do you yeah. start, like? Do you all come together? Do you know the format? Like, what's? I won't start for the next three weeks because I'm finishing my placement. Um, I could postpone my placement, but I already postponed it for the Olympics. So I've, it's a year later already. And if I postpone it again, I won't end up doing it. Um, and then post rugby, I'll have nothing. So <laughs> I need to finish my degree three weeks and then I'm free. Smart to go. Smart decision, I'd say. Yeah. Love yeah. that for you. Teacher yeah. Jazz is going to be back uh, just playing some professional rugby. Yes. So you all, are you all going to be based at the Vale? Are you all coming together like yeah. five days a week or? Yeah, p- four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, um, with exceptions potentially, I think, of Friday and then a, a club. So club Tuesday, Thursdays and then play on the weekend then, which is brilliant. And I think it's important for us for them to still let us play club because that's where we're getting better. That's where we're also learning so much from coaches, player, players around us. Like we have well, many of the um, England Red Roses with us as well. So we're learning loads from, from them as individuals. So yeah, it's brilliant. Looking forward to starting. So good. Awesome. Yes, so good. for that. Yeah, and you guys brilliant. are kind of all playing for these Southern um, kind of Prem 15 sides anyway. You guys are kind of within reach enough. Yeah, we're all playing in England, you mean? Sorry, yeah, yeah but but I mean, in terms of the Prem 15 sides, you guys are relatively yeah. kind Bristol, of concentrated. Gloucester, Bristol, yeah. Gloucester. Yeah, Bristol is the closest to us with then potentially Gloucester being the next one, then Worcester. But Bristol is, well, two hours from my house here, so... And I think it's like two hours 45 to Gloucester and that's the next one. So I, I love uh, Bristol, but at signing, it was the most convenient for me. Um, but I would never leave Bristol now. Not because still a long way, isn't it? Because I love it. Yeah, Still yeah, a really so long a, way. It's a well four hour round trip, but then we don't start, we don't actually start training until quarter past seven. So then we don't actually leave till I think it's quarter past nine. <gasps> By the time we've had two meetings and stuff, well, then we don't get home till caught past 11, shower, bed, and then obviously I'm up at half six. But that's only going to happen for, for <laughs> three weeks, so, and then I'm fine. <laughs> wow. But that, that's the reality of, you know, yeah. obviously, ja- yeah, Jazz is lucky that she's only doing this for three weeks longer now, but there's there's a hell of a there's lot only of girls. 12, yeah, there's only 12 of us who are lucky enough to do that. You've got the, the rest of the 40 Welsh girls who are doing that. Like, I'd probably say about 10 of them are teachers, who will do the same thing as that and if not further because they're traveling even further so yeah it's it's mental it's mad what they have to do but yeah things are going up in Welsh rugby 12 contracts it's got to start somewhere yeah wow Pos- positivity it's going yeah. somewhere hopefully it'll keep yeah. <laughs> growing and expanding big year isn't it world cup got world yeah. cup to come so there's you know there's a lot of things whereby you guys will be Obviously, the 12 of you coming together, but the extended squad as well. There's a lot of, of stuff to, to look forward to, definitely. Does that give 100%. you massive motivation to, for those days where you are getting home at half 11, midnight, and getting up at six, and that there is that World Cup that you, you're shooting for, and, and, it's, and it's all paying off to, to be over there and then competing? Yeah, definitely. And for a World Cup to be in New Zealand, I think that also is striving people to, to want to go there. It's a, it's a brilliant place. Um, and World Cup is a pinnacle of of some people's careers in in the 15s um, setup. So yeah, people are people want to get there. It's been a long five years with it obviously being postponed. I think potentially some girls would have retired after World Cup, so they're hanging on as well. So not hanging on. I mean like <laughs> <laughs> name them, name they them. Should, they should have retired <laughs> ages ago. Those lot. Yeah, they're <laughs> like well they've they've given an extra year of kind of a lifestyle say six in the morning till 12 at night so I think they're just yeah really excited for for that to come and, and it to be to be finally played I can tell you who's hanging on it's the partners and the family members mm. and yeah. the support structure yeah. everyone around them that are it's kind so of hanging true. on for this so true do you worry about the group or are you excited by the group obviously Australia and New Zealand it's not it's not the easiest well is there an easy group I don't mm. know but no. 
Is it? Do you get excited think, by that though? Because obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. really excited because we don't play teams like New Zealand and Australia. So if I think if we pulled a, a, a pool like England and France, I think for us we never get to play any of those teams. So I think it would have been like ah, uh, Rory Germany. Rise. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even though we'll beat England this year, you know what I mean. But, <laughs> 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 no, it's brilliant, and it, yeah, like you say, is there is there an easy pool? Probably not. And New Zealand and, and Australia, they're going to be tough. And the the fourth seeded um, team we're going to pull is probably going to be tough as well. Potentially Scotland. So, like that in itself, they're all going to be tough, tough games. But yeah, really excited, and especially the year we're going to have as as a squad. I think we're, we're only going to get better. Um, potentially not at New Zealand's level. They've been full time for however long, but. Um, definitely striving to, to go out there and, and, and do better than, than we did last time. Okay, well, um, congratulations on your contract, even though this feels like the worst kept secret in <laughs> yeah. all of rugby. <laughs> and uh, best of luck with 2022. And we're really excited to see you get out there and perform and entertain all of us who love watching you. Jazz Joyce. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jazz. Thanks, That's- Jazz. <laughs> That's it for the good, the scars and the rugby. Make sure that you join us next week when we will be chatting to someone Jazz has gone toe-to-toe with a few times.